Well, that was weird. I'm not sure what happened there. I hope everybody's still there. I think it just takes a minute to boot up again here. Not sure what the problem was. Just wait a second until it looks like it's still starting up again here. Must be just a little internet glitch. That certainly happens sometimes when you're on here, depending on those things to work just so. Give it a second. All right. Looks like looks like we're up there again. I have a copy of the outline that I'm going to post just here. And I will put it directly on the comment part over here. And you should be able to get that uh, outline just on the side there of Psalm 150. Hope folks are there. I looks like I'm back up. I'm just going to keep going as if we're here for the sake of time and such. So Psalm 150 is where we find ourselves again this evening, looking at the, the, the blessing and experiencing and seeking to experience the blessing of, of music. So there's a couple of discussion questions there at the beginning to just ask the question, you know, what is there about this? There's a lot of uh, opinion, a lot of conversation, obviously, about music and worship music in particular. And the first question on the outline then is, what appeals to you about the style of worship music? that you like what is it about the style of worship music that you enjoy what is it appeals to you is it is it a certain mood that it seems to reflect does it reflect a certain mood in you in in yourself it causes you to feel something in a certain way perhaps even uh, express a certain feeling is it just what you like hey i i like when music is is upbeat or i like when music is a little more staid a little more quiet what what why does a certain style of music appeal to you think about what style and, and usually you can put a name to it contemporary traditional Classical, Christian pop music, whatever it might be. There's Ruth. Hi, welcome back again. Let's gonna see if I can read uh, Ruth's comment there. I think I can find it on our screen. Just see if it's going there. Sorry about that. Nevertheless, what is it about? The certain style, however you categorize it, that appeals to you. Then let me ask you another question. Let me let me ask the second question on the outline. What appeals to you about the substance of the worship music that you prefer? Is it reflecting uh, theologically sound realities? Is it reflecting in words, the feelings or the mood that you're experiencing at a certain time. Sometimes the substance of worship is something that I want to feel. I, I, I wish I would experience. That, that's how I want to think about life. And there can be words, phrases, concepts that are articulated musically that are helpful to me. You notice even as I try to answer the question that there is a tremendous amount of crossover between style and, and substance. So let me ask you the third question. Which of those questions is it easier for you to answer and why do you think that is? I prefer these kind or this kind or these particular music songs. Why? Does your answer have more to do with style? Or does your answer have more to do in, with substance? What it's like, what it says, how it says it, and the substance of what's actually being 
articulated. Now, why do you think that is? Why, why do you think you prefer a certain style? And I, the substance is in some ways secondary. Well, it's hard to say that, isn't it? Or why do you prefer certain truths that are articulated in worship music? It's becoming, I'm, I'm hearing, at least as I listen, increasingly vogue to criticize certain styles of music, even though the substance of it is truthful. I, I hear some of the brethren whose circles I travel in say that I don't like the Jesus is my girlfriend kind of music. And I think, well, the Song of Solomon has an awful lot to do about romantic relationships. And everything in the scripture points forward to Christ. There's some kind of, not romantic, but certainly an intimate relationship that has to do with emotions and affections towards my Lord. And, and, and some of you are thinking of words to songs and hymns, contemporary or classical, and you may be struggling a little bit like I am to think, well, what is it that actually causes me to like this style over that style? And it's okay to admit it, gang, because in a lot of ways the answer is going to be it's what I have been listening to most of my life. It's what I've been exposed to. I met Downsview Baptist Church because of a certain style of music. Well, what what is that? What what style of music do we enjoy most here at Downsview? My answer would be we enjoy the style of music that we can all sing together. We love to sing. We love it. And so the the truth of the words of what we're saying have got to matter at some point if it's going to be worship music. Don't I, I think we'd probably agree with that. Hey, hi, Karen. Oh, I love it. She says, this is my sister. We should listen to the words and the message, not the style. I don't think you're necessarily excluding the style, saying there has to be a message in the middle of those words. And I think the third point in the outline there is saying what, it make, what makes worship music worshipful, and I think it is that it brings legitimate credit, glory, adoration, praise to the one that we're speaking to or about. We're speaking directly to God, singing directly to him, holy, holy, holy. Or we're singing about him, how great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. But in either case, it's got to be truthfully reflecting the character, the actions, the attributes of God. And so if you look in the Bible study and discussion section there, uh, as we mentioned, this is a short psalm. It brings the Psalter to an end. It's bookended with the, the command to praise God. And there's a series of who, where, why, and hows with respect to the what. So on the far right-hand side, I I've, I've left, left it blank there, but the... Uh, verses are, are there. So the what do we do is obviously praise the Lord. That's a command. It's an imperative statement. It means to do this, to, to praise God. And so the first one is, well, who is to worship? Who is to do that? Who is to praise God? And it's there in verse 6. Let everything. Exactly. I know some of you got your Bibles open and you're answering. It's just written right there. Let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Anything that does not have breath is not alive. So everything that is alive should be praising the Lord. Now, some of you are immediately thinking of Psalm 19 in Romans chapter 1, how the creation uh, declares the glory of God, right? How God has designed the creation to point to the designer, and that's absolutely true. Here, 
just understand that the command is not given to inanimate objects. If these people fail to praise me with their lips, Jesus said, the very rocks will cry out. Well, sure, in the sense that they will do what they're designed to do. But Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, has not had Psalm 150 written to the mountains and the bullfrogs and the dandelions. It's written to, to people. So that's why everything that has breath. And I think what the implication of that is, as long as we have breath, we should be praising the Lord. Ranillo, good evening, brother. Glad you, glad, glad you made it. Welcome. So secondly, who is to worship? Where are they to worship? Well, you see that in verse 1. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise God in his mighty heavens. I think it's relatively uh, self-explanatory there. In his sanctuary is the official church, if you will, synagogue, temple, the place where the people of God met with God. Sanctuary sounds like uh, sanct. Defy, it has the root word of being made holy. And so in the place where the holiness of God is made much of, or praise him in his mighty heavens. Okay. Can we just say it simply this way? Everything, as long as it has breath, should praise God wherever it is whether that's in the corpus, corporate, which means body, the corporate gathered body of Christ, or whether the corporate body of Christ is now not gathered corporately, like tonight, while you're listening on Facebook Live. As we're just scattered across the GTA. We're scattered around Ontario. Perhaps there's folks internationally even. We're just all over to praise God. And so who's to worship is everything. Where are they to worship is inside and outside. Why are they to worship? Why, why are we called to worship? And I always am intrigued when God, in his kindness, gives us the answer to our why questions. Uh, I find that there are often more uh, questions and answers sometimes. Of why is God doing what he's doing? Well, why does he say that? Well, why is that the way we're supposed to do things? Well, sometimes he tells us why. Here in verse 2, why are we supposed to worship him? Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. His excellent greatness is his moral perfection, his character, his attribute, who he is. And praise him for his mighty deeds. That's what he's done. That's how he's operated. That's how he has conducted himself. It's his actions. So why are we supposed to worship him? For what? For his attributes and his action. For who he is and what he's done. Again, you're, you're noticing something here, aren't you? Everything, everywhere, all the time, for anything that he's done or anything about him. Lillian, good evening. Florence? I never know if it's Lillian or Florence. I kind of think it's Florence connected to Lillian. I'll wave at the across the parking lot there. But uh, glad you're here again as well. We're in Psalm 150, guys. There's a, an outline just up top. No, I thought I had it right. I did have it right. Yeah, up, up here. Anyway, up at the top, you can find the outline for it. Psalm 150. So this is all-encompassing. Everyone, all the time, everywhere, about everything that God is and that God has done. And then, how are we to do that? Because we may say, okay, I'm in. What do I do? And he says in verse 3, 4, and 5, how are they to worship? With the trumpet, with the harp, with the lyre, with the timbrel, with dancing. You hear that Baptist church? Bible says there's times to worship God with dancing. We'll get into that in a minute. With stringed instruments, with the pipe, with loud and resounding cymbals. And so, hi Ruth, 
I thought you were there. Glad you're able to listen in as well. And so what you've got is, sorry, when he's, he's telling them what they're to worship with, there's wind instruments, there is percussion instruments, there are stringed instruments, there are woodwinds and brass instruments, there's dancing, which I think dancing simply at least refers to some kind of physical movement that is connected to our musical worship of God. And so most of us, we, we kid with ourselves that we're not great dancers or we don't love to, to dance. That's some of the other Christian denominations that you, know, you have different names for them and you, you know the ones you think of. But sometimes clapping to the beat in worship. Some people love that. Some people think it's not appropriate. Some folks are raising their hands in worship. Some folks are raising, praising God for what he's done and who he is. Uh, some folks are closing their eyes. Maybe they're swaying a little bit. Some folks are holding hands. Some folks are tapping their feet. There's some kind of physical action, some kind of physical movement that's connected to how it is we're supposed to praise God. And I think that's exactly right. And there's even a volume with loud symbols and loud resounding or clashing symbols, which means there's got to be a lot more to this than the pipe organ or the piano as the only permissible how-to where to worship the Lord. Everything, everywhere, for everything about God, and it's almost any sound you can make, however you make it, make it to the glory of God. Now, again, question number three under our discussion section says, now before the contemporary worship people cheer and the more traditional people go looking for proof text to prove them wrong, which is sometimes the aspect that happens right about now. It's, all right, well, yeah, I know that's what it says, but it doesn't mean that. Let me show you why. Um, Let's just understand a couple of fundamentals here. When we hear the word praise praise the Lord, and again, the psalm, remember, is, is bookended with uh, the imperative to praise the Lord in, in verse 1 and the end of verse 6. Praise the Lord. What What's that? What is the word praise in Hebrew? It's not alleluia. No, on Palm Sunday, we heard them singing hosannas. Hosanna literally means save me or come and save me. The people were asking Jesus as he came into Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey to come and save us. In some ways, they didn't even know what they were asking. But this word praise him is that other word that some of you may have got there. It's the word hallelujah. Hallel is that Hebrew root, which literally means to shine, to reflect, right? Like, like stars shining, not like the sun shining. There's different words for that. But like the stars shining, and stars shine in the sky, uh, like similar, similar to the sun. There's just a, there's a, I guess I'm talking about too many fine points at this point. But it's the reflected glory of something else. That's literally where it's going. So it's like the way the moon shines. The moon shines at night not because the moon is a source of light, but because it reflects the sun and the stars. And so it's a primarily a Hebrew root word that means to be reflecting Light And so to praise God means to hallelujah, yes, but what does that mean? To reflect the glory of God. The Shekinah glory came down and visited his people during the old covenant days. He was shining and he was being reflected. Part of the thing that we try to do nowadays in particular, I hope, is that we are seen as and known as people who are praising God 
in all that we do. And by praising God in all that we do, we are reflecting the worth of the one we represent. That means I'm going to think differently about that nut on the 401 that was going 70 kilometers an hour because they're never out on the 401, but they're out there now because lots of room. Or the guy who was going 170 that I rolled down my window and said, hey, bud, listen, there's still a speed limit. And he smiled. And I thought, right there, God just protected me because I had a chance to smile and talk to him for a minute and think about the one I was representing. The way we talk to the people across the uh, counter in Chopper's Drug Mart or through the big glass pane that they have in front of them. Who are we reflecting? Who do they think we represent? What do they think about the one that we represent? And again, the kind of circumstance, question number four in the, in the outline is, is what, what kind of circumstances the psalm seem to be pointing to. And although I do think it seems to be pointing to corporate gatherings, to praise him in his sanctuary, there's at least that. It's written to people who, who do love the Lord because they have some. That's who the people are who would know his mighty deeds and his excellent greatness. And so there's, there's something there about corporately gathered. But as we said, it certainly goes well beyond that as well. And I'm going to skip part of that, but there's a number of correlating ideas under the New Testament scriptures as well. John chapter 4, when Jesus is speaking to the Samaritan woman at the well, that the time is coming where all the people of God will worship him, neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem. Hey, it's not about a specific geographical place anymore. They'll worship him in spirit and in truth. From the truth of it, from what God has revealed, and the spirit, I think that means with our spirit, Spirit, our engaged souls and emotions and affections. And there's going to be a time that that's going to come, and that's the time that we're living in. Perhaps Romans chapter 12 comes to your mind, that in view of the mercies of God, that we should offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable God to God, for this is your spiritual act of yeah, of, of worship. Not every virgin says worship, so it's not as definitive a passage as we might get, but certainly offering ourselves as those who would live their lives to make much of our make much of our king. Ephesians chapter five talks about singing to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Ephesians chapter five and Colossians chapter four, almost parallel passages there, but have something to say and kind of reflecting much of what's here in Psalm 150. And I'll ask a couple of other, again, questions just to give you to think through a little bit. It would be nice if we were able to interact. Do you find it easier to explain why you enjoy the kind of music you do in relation to what's wrong with the other styles or based on the elements that you actually prefer? Hi, Tim. Thanks for encouraging us today, brother. Always good to have our leadership development director from Feb Central pop in and say hello for a moment. The great support to us and me personally as our pastors. And Errol's here, one of our leaders. Good evening, brother. Glad you were able to make it as well. Good stuff. We're in Psalm 150, if you haven't seen the outline there. But here's the question. Do you find it easier to explain about the music that you like in relation to what you don't like or what's wrong with other music or based on the things you actually do like about the stuff that you prefer. Do you hear what I'm saying? Well, I like the hymns. They don't have any of that new language and all of that fluff and they don't have this repeating over and over and over again and, and they use all those newfangled music and have you seen how they dress? And uh, you know what the, happens with all those light shows and everything else? And, you know, we don't need that. That doesn't sound like a guy who likes the hymns. That sounds like a guy who doesn't like some levels of 
contemporary music. All those old hymns are so stuffy. They've got all this archaic, out, outdated language. It doesn't appeal to me at all. None of my friends like it. Um, I don't even know what they're talking about, about here I raise an Ebenezer. What in the world is an Ebenezer? I mean, what kind of what kind of old word is word is that? And I don't like to hold on to a hymnal anyway. I just, you know, don't, it's not my thing. That doesn't sound like a person who's articulating an enjoyment of contemporary music. It sounds like someone who just doesn't like the old style or older style. How, how do you respond? When you're asked, as we open our time tonight, about do you prefer some of the, the style or the substance, and is it, do you, do you answer based on what you don't like about an opposite style? Or can you really articulate what's happening about the kind of music that you like yourself personally? Cynthia Sutton. Glad to have you around, old friend. Thanks for dropping in. Cynthia is an old friend of ours from our church time in, in Thunder Bay as well. But I find it it should be a bit of a convicting question. Because if you don't like something, say you don't like it. If you do like something, then you should be able to articulate what it is about that that's there. Godfrey, good to see you, brother. Or at least see your name. Godfrey was the leadership development director when I began with Beb nine years ago. Good brother of mine out in, I always say Bowmanville, man. I'm sorry. It's farther, farther uh, east than that. Maybe it is Bowmanville. Have I got it right already? Thousand Islands Baptist Church in, I don't know, almost as far east as you can go in Ontario. Anyway, glad you dropped in, Godfrey. Let me let me let me try to frame it in in this question. If you're looking at Charles Linus, question number seven. Tim Keller, uh, one of the pastors of Redeemer Bath, a Redeemer a Presbyterian Church in New York, one of the founders of the Gospel Coalition, real solid, solid, solid guy. He says this: the musical style has almost zero theological value when it comes to the authenticity of worship. Really. I mean, it's helpful when he says almost, but almost no theological value. Theology is the right understanding of God. And theological value is seen primarily in the truthfulness of what we're singing and saying about God. But I think John Piper's also right when he says that there is a kind of mood and style that should match what we're singing about. And he parallels that with preaching. If, if we are at a funeral of a tragic situation, of someone who died, as far as we know, well before it was their time, God numbers our days, we know that. But from our perspective, we say things like it was too soon or he was too young. Do we dance up there with a incredibly joyful, as if we're celebrating a wedding kind of style? Or if we're at a wedding, are we singing the most somber, delicate, reflective, soft, music as the bridal party is presented as Mr. and Mrs. Pete Charlebois and they're almost physically dancing down the aisles and we're kind of just everything's very somber. There's some theological value to the style matching the substance, don't you think? Chris Vieira, thanks for popping in, brother. Chris Vieira is a brother pastor of mine now out in Emo, Ontario, which is just past Fort Francis. As far as you can go on Young Street, almost. That's another story. Johann Sebastian Bach, who is not known as a contemporary hymn writer, contemporary music writer, he lived almost 100 years, 1658 to 1750. Eight years. 
short of 100. He wrote, um, Joy of Man's Desire, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. On the death of his wife, he wrote a song called, If Thou But Suffer God to Guide Thee. And in the dedication of the work, he wrote it and dedicated it to his 17-year-old son who had just lost his mother. If you but trust in God to guide you and place your confidence in him, you'll find him always there beside you to give you hope and strength within. For those who trust God's changeless love, build on the rock that will not move. Amazing. You don't dance across the stage with clanging cymbals with that one. There's, there's something about a mood and an event that's captured by music. And some of you know what it's like to see an interesting mix of that, isn't there? When our secretary in Sault Ste. Marie passed away quite tragically, her husband, who's a very good musician, and the rest of her family, they sang, Blessed Be the Name of the Lord at the funeral. And it was upbeat. And they sang it with tears running down their cheeks, as many of us did. Because the style actually matched the mood because there was a real confidence in the hope that Jan had beyond this life. and was with her Lord and they could bless God who had given and God who had taken away. And sometimes those, those songs kind of overlap in their reality of how they apply. Let me give you one more quote and then start thinking of now. What are some of your favorite songs, music, worship songs? And, and just put them over in the comment section. Start typing them out now if you want. Go online and copy and paste it over there. Just give me the title. What are some of your favorite ones that we can share with one another tonight? What are some of your favorite worship songs, however you define that? And if you can help us understand how they grip you and how they might help us. Bob Coughlin, who leads Sovereign Grace Music, says this. The better or more accurately we know God through his word, the more genuine our worship will be. So that's truth. In fact, the moment we veer from what is true about God, we're engaging in idolatry, untruth. Regardless of what we think or feel, there is no authentic worship of God without a right knowledge of God. I think that's absolutely right. I think my sister had it right at the beginning of our evening tonight that the style has always got to be trumped by the substance and the truthfulness. If God is not represented accurately, and the only way we know if it's accurate is relative to the scripture, so you filter my singing through the scriptures, and if what comes out on the other end is, is what I prefer, then I know what I prefer is connected to the scriptures. And it's a true representation of who God is, and it's valid. Let me make a, a statement that some of you may not agree with. Well, you can tell me what you think. If it's not true, it's not helpful for you. Well, I think it is. Well, I perceive it that way. Well, I think that's probably the, the way it is. doesn't matter. If it's not true, it's not helpful. The truth will set you free, Jesus said. Hi, Barb. Thanks for stopping in. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Well, there's certain ideas that just help me. No, they don't help you. You think they're helping you. They may mask a problem. Alex, brother, thanks for stopping in. They might mask a problem. But the scriptures have got to be the dominant focus. And when it comes to worship music, what should be gripping us is that's true. Therefore, I love to sing it in a more traditional style, perhaps, or just let it go like Carolyn and Chandra, the front and the back of our church, right? There's only a few of us who raise our hands and in worship, 
but you don't doubt their sincerity, do you? They love the Lord, and they're showing us that they do. So what are some of yours? What are some of your favorite hymns? What are some of your favorite contemporary songs? Maybe you've got a line from one that's helpful for you. You might not even remember the, the hymn it's from, but maybe you've got a, a line that you can remember. I've got a, a couple that I, I kept here that I found are particularly helpful. Somebody's going to write one on there, and I'm not going to, I'm going to miss it. Ah, Minda, welcome. Sorry, I should have been sliding down the bar. There you go. Victory in Jesus, Errol says, because he lives. Wonderful. To God be the glory, Ranillo. Great things he's done. Ruth says, what a friend we have in Jesus. And this is the day that the Lord has made. Very good. Lillian or Florence. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. That the contemporary one, Florence? Yeah, I love that. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Really good command there, isn't it, uh, Minda? Cynthia, oh, our rock and our redeemer. Gracious savior of our weary heart. That's my new favorite song, Cynthia. Yeah. It's by Sovereign Grace Ministries. Absolutely beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. We're going to sing it on. Easter Sunday, Lord willing. As the deer pants for the water brook, Alex Bell. Excellent. Directly out of Psalm 42, right? There's power in the blood, Cynthia. There sure is. Absolutely. He's alive. There's a lot of versions of that one as well, Alex. Yeah, indeed. I hope those of you who are watching, you're, you're noticing those songs that are being written there, and this video will be up on my Facebook page when we're done tonight, and you'll be able to access those and just you know cut and paste them, throw them into YouTube. You'll be able to find lots of different one ways that they're sung there, and just sing along with them. Just either open out or in your heart, either way. Oh, great God of highest heaven! It's one of my favorite songs. This is the the. Last chorus of it in the comment bar there I put in. You are worthy to be praised with my every thought and deed. Oh, great God of highest heaven, glorify your name through me. I just, there's, there's, some, there's some songs, there's some hymns that they just never get old, do they? <laughs> and I'll give you a, I'll give you a link there to where you can you can listen to that that song. It's an older Sovereign Grace Ministries one there, but Oh Great God by Sovereign Grace. Jesus paid it all, Minda says, and a great one for this time leading up to Monday, Thursday, tomorrow, the day of the new commandment, the last of the last Passovers and the first of the Lord's Supper. Do this now to remember me. Passover, of course, looked forward to the time the Messiah would come. The Lord's table looks backwards because he's come. Uh, what else there? All heavens declare the glory of the risen Lord. Lawrence, Lillian, beautiful. That little red chorus book, which doesn't just have choruses in it. It has full songs sometimes. Just an um, amazing thing. to. It's a little bit older now, so most of us know the songs. You can just go over and over uh, what's been what's been said there what's been what's been sung and, and easy to sing along i find it if i know the songs uh that i can sing along a little easier to them it's makes it all that much better for me i know if angelo was on angelo and laura out in bc of course this would be one of his favorites be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. And yet it's the third verse that really 
gets me in Be Thou My Vision. I posted it there. Cynthia, all to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I surrender most. Isn't that how that one goes, Cynthia? I surrender just about all. No, that's not what it says. I surrender all. That's the idea. Surrender is such a good word to come to Christ to think about how do I give myself to him? What do I do? How do I close with Jesus? That's the word. Wave the white flag. Chris Tomlin wrote a song about white flag, and it really is just about the word surrender. How about the king is coming, Renillo? Excellent. He's coming, and he's coming sooner than he was yesterday. Good thing to remember this time of year, no doubt. Absolutely. I miss any there? Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Doesn't mean all praise is empty. Thou my inheritance, now and always. When we left our home church in Thunder Bay, after 10 years as in training and as an associate pastor, the last song Pam had them sing, thinking when they asked her what song I'd like, she picked this one. And when we went across town to First Baptist Church in Thunder Bay, the first song, without asking, was Be Thou My Vision. And I just praise God to this day. It's very humbling that that would be the kind of song that would begin one ministry as we ended another one. I think Kelly Freeman popped in there. Kelly, glad to see you. Saw TJ on the post earlier today. Other songs that come to your mind that you love, a line of a song, the substance of which helps you, the style of which connects with you. One thing about Psalm 150 is clearly the style is with many musical instruments. Clearly the Lord is the object. And there's nothing about the content of the worship in this case other than to sing about who God is and what God has done. And it's pretty broad. But I think some of you will know that when you can attach the substance, the truth, the words of the songs to a particular passage of Scripture, or at least an idea that you know is there in Scripture, it, it, it just enlivens your experience of worship so much, doesn't it? Because you know it's true. And so there's a liberty there. Just to, yes, I can just sing of this wonderful truth. Last, uh, I think it was last Thursday. It might have been Friday when I put the uh, daily update on, and we looked at Psalm 150 for a few minutes. One of the things that I, I mentioned is to take advantage of these. And I, I listed there four different musical styles, uh, four different songs that had four really different musical styles. And I didn't get any comments on the fact that the blind, the blind boys of Alabama, that's what they call themselves, they are some elderly gentlemen now who have been singing for many, many years. And they sang Amazing Grace to the tune of House of the Rising Sun which the original tune was certainly not a godly Christian song, but boy, the way they put those words to it. And I just love when I see worship music being redeemed for the glory of God. And, and some of you would know that, that uh, Martin Luther, when he wrote A Mighty Fortress is Our God, the tune of it was a tune that was sung to a very different song in many of the pubs in, in Germany. And it, Really didn't go over all that well right off the bat. But I think today if you said, you know, what about a mighty fortress is our God? Oh, yeah. And I love to see the experience of or the picture of how God is redeeming the world back to himself. That, that's, that's what he's to do. And that's what we're to do as Christians. Minda mentions, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. What psalm is that, everybody? Yeah. Psalm 51, great psalm of confession of David after his horrific sin of adultery and murder between Bathsheba and her husband. David is asking God to cleanse his heart. Beautiful song. Hallelujah. Chorus, Alex Bell. <laughs> now you're talking. It's one of my wife's favorite songs. I just can't wait for Christmas. And now at Easter... I mean, this year it's obviously very different, but often symphonies will not only put Handel's Messiah out at Christmas time, but also at Easter. Just a beautiful rendition of the truths of 
this narrative account from creation to culmination of God's business in the world. Cynthia mentions, it is well with my soul. Horatio Spafford's reflection on the death of his wife and at least the death of his daughters and his wife wrote back to him and beautiful truth that he was assured of God's kindness. Jesus, there is none like you. Beautiful. All glory to God. What it says? Sorry. All glory be to Christ. The great song, All Glory Be to Christ, that's from the tune of Old Lang Syne. And it's a magnificent, again, redemption of another tune to the Lord. <laughs> okay, I won't dominate. Lots of worship singers will never have. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Cynthia. Cynthia came over and, and sang at uh, First Baptist Church while Pam and I were there. It was a beautiful treat for us as well. Other songs, other concepts. Are there things that we can pray about in particular for you as we're about to wrap up in the next three or four minutes? If there's particular prayer requests. Remember, one of the great things to use music for and understand that music even is, is a prayer. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. I mean, that's that's a prayer. Hey, you'll hear me sometimes down to you when I'm, up in the church services and we will have sung and I'll come up to pray afterwards and I'll say, let's continue to pray. As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul longeth after thee. I mean, that's just crying out to God. It's it, it, Use music as a prayer. Use the, the way that musical artists have, have articulated these things to be prayers directly. To God. When we consider many musical styles, what do we usually, music or worship styles, it usually means music, doesn't it? And Psalm 150 is very clear that worship has more to do with the content of what we're saying than just the style. But we want to ask God to continue to give us wisdom that we have the right styles to match the mood of what we're singing, just like the style of preaching has to matter the match the mood of what we're preaching about. Any final thoughts there, gang? I'm going to pray together in a moment, and we'll wrap up. This has been really interactive. I just I want to thank you so much for doing this. I know the audio or video quality is not great. People tell me the audio quality is fine now. The Lord provided me with a microphone finally. But for you stopping in like this, gang, um, just broadly across the the net this way, really grateful that you would do this. Uh, we call it the Downsview Baptist Church Congregational Connection because although this is not a large uh, interaction with uh, our voices, certainly I can see the kind of things that you're thinking about and the things that we can discuss and talk with each other about. And you're certainly sharing those, everything in the comment section. Everyone else, anyone who's on my Facebook can see those things, and so that helps other people understand and I think there is a sense of camaraderie, a sense of corporateness, of the corpus together, the body of Christ. So I am grateful that the Lord has given us again this time together. We will be in uh, Monday, Thursday, tomorrow. Do remember it if you don't have a particular service to go to, but that's the day of the new commandment. Monday means is a Latin word, mandatum, which means commandment. Uh, Jesus said on that Day at the occasion of the Last Supper that uh, I give you a new commandment that you love one another as I have loved you um, just as I've loved you you must love one another it's a new commandment because there's a new standard and there's a new object and so we're to love not just neighbors but one another and we're to love not like we love like we love ourselves but like Jesus has loved us and it's a higher standard and a higher calling, and therefore how much more we need the Holy Spirit. So let's pray together, shall we, gang, as we wrap up. Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity to be together tonight this way. Hallelujah to the Lord on high who has given us technology like this to get together. Dear God, thank you for the yearning for us to be with one another. It is a compliment as we desire to be more together than we are. We pray, Heavenly Father, that it would be your kind intention to keep us close and that where we can't physically be close, uh, give us grace, give us patience, give us perseverance, 
give us increased and ongoing longing to be together again. I pray, Heavenly Father, that your goodness, your attributes, your acts, your character uh, would be on display and be reflected in our lives, and therefore that our lives would be lives of praise, that our lives and that our worship would be ongoing, not just on a Sunday morning, not just on a Wednesday evening, but that all of our lives would be worshiped, that we would reflect accurately and with the right style and attitude and heart behind it, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we humbly pray. Amen. Thank you, friends. Good evening. See you next Wednesday, Lord willing. Alrighty. I know.